So the motivation for this talk actually was twofold. One was uh, when I was working on a drug production common list application that has maybe around 100 uh, viral dependencies. Transitive, obviously. Um, so when you're working on such application that uh, is developed over a long period of time, you usually uh, avoid all the infrastructure and configuration things, like uh, how do you ensure that all the dependencies are available at new time, how to integrate with purchase um, integration systems, uh, and other stuff like that, uh, if you know about uh, Jenkins, the ADCIs, uh, and different uh, things. Like so this was uh, the practical motivation, and another part was uh, when I was just thinking about this problem uh, of main conflicts in communism uh, somewhere, on, probably on the internet, or maybe at uh, this podium, I heard this quote, probably by exactly, unfortunately I couldn't, couldn't find the source, but uh, actually, actually in the communism, uh, any uh, Package name conflicts, Russian conflicts may be solved with a proper application of the name package. And so I thought, is there true? I, I always uh, wanted to uh, test uh, if the communist environment is so flexible as they say it is. And so I thought, you know, okay, let's, let's try to implement the proof of concept and see if it's really the case that uh, name conflicts, different name conflicts, can be solved in this way. And then I, when I started doing it, this is my second approach to this problem, uh, I also encountered uh, some things that were unexpected. And so this picture, probably one uh, person is myself, and the other is like, personified by ASDF. <laughs> so if you have, if anyone heard about uh, this cool uh, new approach to machine learning, which is called the Sario learning, and there are two systems that compete one tries to fool each other and the other. So this was the case also here when I uh, tried to implement this and learned a lot of stuff about ACF and what you can do with it and what you cannot do and why. And, uh, and so the third part, uh, so actually this paper turned into two parts. One, implementation of the algorithm for the goal of name conflict, name and version conflicts, and the other, uh, like, so say, a critic of some parts of ACF that can, can be improved and how they can be improved. Okay, so let's move on to the serious part. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, the problem of dependency health. Probably a lot of people have heard it and have been encountered it. Uh, then uh, the state of the list like system and how it uh, can solve this problem. The scenarios uh, of possible uh, dependency health and uh, our solution. The conclusions to it. Yeah, so, um, Dependency uh, If you look at the Wikipedia article for it, you will see that there are a lot of things that uh, are uh, fall under this category, a subtype, so this type. And uh, the, the ones that uh, are most interesting to the application for them, from my point of view, are the two which can be resolved, resolved uh, in a, an automatic way. Uh, and these are either when uh, there are two packages. That, uh, conf uh, that have conflicting names and two unrelated packages, and you have to incorporate both of them into your system. Uh, and the other, part, uh, the other type is when you have one package, uh, it changes over time, so in different versions have different uh, functionality, uh, but also it has the same name. And uh, you don't depend on this package directly, but you uh, depend on some packages that depend on it. And so they have parallel evolution, which brings to a point when, at some point in time, you want to uh, have two dependencies which uh, have conflicting transit dependencies. And you can do anything about it, you can compile uh, the whole your system. Uh, and this is actually, um, this problem exists in almost every computing environment. It's, it has different names, like uh, the very famous Windows name DLL file. And then Jar Hell in Java and RPM Hell and APT Hell and <laughs> so you name it. Uh, there are other instances that are not so interesting to, uh, in all this this talk. And so in the CLG system, actually both of these uh, cases that I mentioned may exist. 
one was reported, uh, for instance, uh, when the nickname ET was used by two different packages, uh, by different systems. And the other uh, probably is not, uh, has not been reported, but uh, obviously it exists in some way or another, is potential. So in, uh, in this talk I actually focused on the second part because uh, for, for two reasons. The first reason is the first part is actually solvable uh, quite easily if ISDF, if on top of ISDF, especially if ISDF has some more features that we want to talk about later. Uh, and also it's solvable uh, socially, for instance, uh, model threads, uh, obviously overrides other potential competitors for its name, and this can be solved as well, for instance, on the repository. Uh, but the second problem, uh, Right. There are different approaches to solving it. I think in the last year, EOS, uh, um, Tony also presented his uh, approach when every new version of a library should get a new name, which is uh, interesting but not scalable from my point of view uh, because it limits the programmer very, very severely. Uh, and at the same time, this problem uh, is really like, to arise eventually if you have a long running system that works over time. Uh, so what uh, most languages, uh, how most languages can deal with this problem? Uh, usually this quote characterizes the situation pretty well and the tense was, I don't know, I won't read it in full, but it ends with if you can uh, if you can like do man uh, manually ensure that you even have complete versions of the same package in your Set up, then you should uh, unleash a chromatic value and leave it into your keyboard. I don't know what else to say, but I guess uh, it's not very good. Uh, and this is the situation in Python, and in, I think at least in most of the languages that I encountered, when uh, where the um, modules are tied, pretty, uh, tied uh, tightly into the file system, and uh, uh, if you want a particular version of a model, of a model, uh, then the other version will override it all. The conflicts you are un unable to hold two versions at the same time. However, uh, there are some examples where they solve the uh, version conflict problem uh, or this have a programmatic solution to it. Uh, Java is famous for having a way to redefine or override the class, the default class order, which allows to load uh, several classes with the same name, uh, one with the default uh, approach and another, and the other with uh, like a specific custom approach. Uh, here is a code from Stack Overflow that shows an example of how it can be done. It's pretty low level, but uh, on top of it, uh, such project as Projects such as OSGI, for instance, in new, which allows to have version models. And also, I think the new thing in Java, which will be available in Java 9, is Project Jigstore, which also uses it to the problem. Because the Java, actually, was my experience, a very painful experience when I worked with Jetty, and at some point uh, in transition from Jetty version 6 to Jetty version 7, they named uh, all the next phase, it was like one way Jetty, and then it became a big Jetty, and like, you had to uh, basically change all your inputs and all your code because of this uh, if not for the automatic refactoring things it would be very painful. Uh, another example which is I think, much more interesting is JavaScript because JavaScript is not easy to not the language you go to see uh, interesting solutions to program uh, to the problems of program language design. I think it occurred uh, in JavaScript okay, uh, just incidentally because it, JavaScript doesn't have, didn't have a package system for a long time, and so when people started implementing it, they just used the object system in JavaScript and uh, implemented packages. This, uh, this is how it's done in Node.js, uh, like in the context of an object. Uh, so unlike most, almost all programming systems, where packages uh, are set, uh, the center repository of known main spaces that are accessible globally, in JavaScript. As far as I understand, uh, there is no such central repository. So there is some central repository, but usually the packages are uh, 
implemented in a way that they are loaded in the context of a particular namespace. So they are like, folded into a namespace. So uh, if you have two models in the same way, uh, just by loading them inside different namespaces, you, you don't uh, get name on it. So this is kind of a distribution of a distributed approach to um, package definition, which just eliminates this problem. And this is pretty nice. Uh, so this is the situation in other languages. In common list, uh, as you know, we have a uh, centralized package system. Uh, so packages are basically uh, asymptotal objects that are globally accessible. And so uh, and they are accessible by their names. So when you define a particular package uh, with a particular name, it, uh, it takes this name and uh, holds to it. And so if another package will have the same name, it will either redefine the existing package or the name of it. Uh, and another uh, uh, feature of the common list package system is that it's dynamic, so you can define the packages on the fly, you can rename them, and you can change the contents. And basically, packages are names, uh, uh, collections of symbols. Uh, so name objects uh, in common list exist uh, not just on the level of packages because uh, on the level of packages you don't have a notion of a version or a model. Uh, so they, uh, they become apparent on the level of packages, but to solve them you, you should also use uh, other parts of the system. And so if you look just from the package perspective, uh, if there's a name conflict, uh, you can use you can use the name package to alter the name of one of the packages, but the first one you can load it, and then uh, you can load the second package and avoid the name of it. Uh, this can be done dynamically, uh, so in principle this should, this should work. So the potential pitfalls are, first of all, you should have a way to discover the conflict. And this is not uh, mainly not legal because, uh, because you either have to code block all your code and, uh, to do it programmatically, or you have to know beforehand, uh, so you can discover after the fact and then uh, redo your recording from scratch. Uh, another part is choosing the proper time to rename the packages because uh, usually you load the packages uh, in order for them to be used by other packages, and so if you rename the package prematurely before loading the uh, users, they will, uh, will not be able to access the renamed package. And also, uh, it limits the frequent use of eval and return and so on uh, uh, because if uh, in your code you refer to the old name you will have problems. Uh, so the other part uh, that is required to solve the problem of main conflicts and conflicts is uh, the system facility. So the system facility provides uh, modularization and version and, and basically provides packaging of uh, in, in the sense that this uh, word is used general work, programming languages. And the fact is that this idea, which is modeled, uh, I, I would say, which is system was inspired by the least package system. If you look at how fine system is implemented, it's, it is implemented in its API, it's very close to fine package. And so ISDF also has a central memory register of known systems, uh, which are also known by name, although ISDF has a notion of progression and as a proper configuration management system should not just have this notion but support it fully. Um, unfortunately uh, it doesn't support it uh, up to the level of uh, knowing about different versions of the system. It just knows that there is a sub system by this name and all the other properties are opaque to the system until you query to them in the process of uh, working with a particular SDF file or SDF definition. And so SDF is a very important part of the common list of the system. It's the basis for implementing different uh, other uh, things like uh, package distribution systems like QuickList and also provides uh, a compatibility layer of utility functions for this uh, file system with ASD files. Um, and so the good names in name in complex solutions should be based upon these definitions of this. <coughs> Uh, so, however, it has limitations. The first one I, has, I have already mentioned. Uh, it just has a one-to-one -one, uh, name, name to system correspondence. 
So you, you have two systems with the same version, uh, I mean, two systems with the same name and two different versions, as they can uh, know about both of them at one time. So it will uh, either find the first one or the second one, or if it uh, will load and then load some of them, and then afterwards if it will somehow find another system, it will either uh, redefine the existing knowledge or it will uh, just break. So this is a fundamental limitation that is supporting uh, this work and this work is multiple versions of the same system. Uh, and so, say, uh, for instance, you cannot call a system with a fine system with a version argument. So whatever ISDF happens to find, it considers it to be the proper thing. And then if it doesn't suit your uh, version, it will know it after the fact when it will go to load, open it, another operation and just say that this is uh, not good. So it's, it reads versions as constraints, not as uh, clues to finding something, although it could do it. Uh, so that is not it I actually think ISDF is a very, uh, very good tool for it. It does uh, not know what's pretty well for this scenario, although it's, it falls short of uh, the potential that it has actually to become a uh, uh, framework for developing various um, uh, strategies for creating these packages and models. Like the one, uh, this is the one strategy that I'm working on. This paper is an example, but it's not limited to just this. And so, what the uh, what limits ISDF uh, in terms of doing it is first of all, um, some things may be improved in terms of its API. Um, uh, so SDF operations are, uh, so basically SDF currently is more or less a monolith tool. Although it, it has a lot of object orientation built into it and you can um, define some parts, but uh, these parts actually depend on other parts that are harder to define and uh, not documented also. Uh, so when you start doing it, you understand that there are a lot of hidden assumptions uh, that you start violating. And, uh, also, these assumptions uh, regard from, um, how the internal state of ISDF is manipulated by, by most of ISDF operations, even those that may be uh, made differential transparent and uh, much more easy to operate. Uh, yeah, so ISDF provides this high level API for its use case of building the systems uh, and also it provides a low level. API for monitoring the uh, file system, which is called UEOP, but it falls short on the mid level API for manipulating the ISDF definitions themselves. Uh, and so, for the examples of the shortcomings uh, are the following. For instance, ISDF can load a system from a specific file system. Okay. So, if there's no function in the ISDF API where you can give a file system location and tell it to load this ISDF file. Uh, you cannot enumerate all potential candidate locations for your system because all SDF uh, system discovery functions they uh, should return the first system they find and just uh, stop. Uh, you cannot find the system with a specified version installed. You cannot uh, reward the source files of the system components without potentially rewarding these dependencies and potentially even rewarding SDF itself and engaging it. And <laughs> so uh, it's a one, uh, it becomes a very long tail. And uh, you just can, you cannot just, for instance, uh, read the contents of some ASDF file and see what systems are defined there and examine them and see like, what are their versions, dependencies, and so on. We will get back to this in a moment, but uh, let's return to the use case of the authors. So, the, uh, how many uh, objects, uh, version conflict between the packages with the same name may appear in all this? There are different cases, right, which are building blocks of more complex cases. The, the basic case, the zero case, is when you don't have a conflict. Right? So we have some uh, root system and it has uh, two dependencies and four transitive dependencies. And so when uh, you have versions to it, the basic uh, conflict case is... Where is it? Yes, I see. Okay, so the basic conflict case is. Uh, is 
is when you just have uh, two dependencies uh, at the same or on the same level and uh, they have different versions. So if I was therefore was able to know about these different systems, then you could, what we could do is uh, we could, uh, and so this is the idea for the algorithm which you, I will elaborate on later. We can uh, we could load a system bus and load the system prem or the system full, and at this moment rename all the packages defined in prem so that we could load the next system and uh, load it, and there will be no name of it. No, no, not to define uh, rename, right? Uh, there are other scenarios when, uh, more, more, a little bit more complicated scenarios, when the, one of the version dependencies is under root system, uh, but the same thing can, can happen if you properly order this uh, dependent, uh, root dependency, you will just first load uh, this part, uh, rename the system, and then, uh, I'm sorry, that way around. So you will just first load uh, this part, and uh, the process in bar you will rename full, and then load this. There's also stability when you have uh, dependencies on, on several intersecting, um, so it's a several intersecting conflicts, and also a uh, combination of both, like when you have uh, several systems and they are intersecting and they also are at different levels in this case. So all these cases are covered uh, by the test cases in the system, so we can look at the tests and see how uh, they handle and actually working with every one of them uh, made me add some, make some additions to the code and they would reevaluate my assumptions and how it should work. So the uh, idea of the algorithm uh, for resolving the conflict is the, is the following. So first of all, we should deal with the dependency tree and uh, see if there are potential conflicts just by examining uh, the versions of the systems and if the same system has different versions in this tree, then there is a conflict. Uh, this no conflict, obviously. For back to SDF, in case of conflicts, we should uh, what we should do, we should determine the topmost user that uh, doesn't, uh, um, so there's basically there's a common ancestor of these uh, two systems that uh, where the conflict will be applied. Here the root, here it will be uh, the conflict between bus and bus also the root. Yeah. Uh, for instance, here uh, the conflict between between uh, prem and prem will be uh, will manifest in bar. Right? So there, that's a common ancestor and before, uh, so uh, at some point below it, there is uh, the user of the dependency that can that uses one version and uh, the user that uses the other version because if two versions of this were directly uh, under bar, the conflict would just uh, well, it is not possible by design because um, in current list, in current implementation, uh, no one could depend on two versions of the same uh, system. So, so in this, uh, if you find the topmost user at this place, you can rename uh, the packages. And so after that, let's determine the old order of systems uh, in just a logical sort, and uh, with some additional constraints, and uh, we can load the system components one by one, and at the right moments, rename all the uh, packages. This implies that we need to capture in some way how what each package is defined in the process of forwarding the system. Uh, yeah, so this is done in stage six, and after that, uh, the rename. So here is the code I want to talk about. Actually, this is a simplified version of the main part of the code of the algorithm, which will be simple. I will just uh, talk about this in uh, both. So the first part is there is a function that traverses the dependency tree and uh, looks for potential uh, conflicts and determines the remains. Uh, then your dependencies and uh, if you detect the conflict, uh, we do the remains, which is factored into a uh, macro here. And uh, if there is conflict, you load the system. Uh, if there's no conflict, we just load the components of the system. Unfortunately, this is not, so this can be done by the directly, so there's 
special function here. And uh, the whole is the same as the remaining part happens uh, this way, so we, uh, um, before all the system, we uh, find out uh, that the packages that uh, are existing in, in the image, then we uh, load, uh, do, do some work over the systems, and then we do a set different between the new, the packages added, and the existing packages, and then rename them. Uh, so what's the limitations of this approach? First of all, it uses this passive way of capturing the changes to the package system. Uh, so uh, this means that uh, it will not... Um, uh, so there are some convoluted ways when you will redefine the existing packages or define them beforehand and uh, it will not be able to capture them. So the alternative is code walking for the whole tree, which is I think over to the situation. And so this so this uh, approach is actually targeted at automatic scenarios. When you have an uh, uh, interactive workflow and you change packages uh, frequently, this will be this workflow. And so it doesn't uh, handle monkey pressure, although it may not be actually intended for this. Uh, it doesn't handle implicit transitive dependencies, and when it's implemented, it uh, gets dependencies from the definition. But this can be easily solved by just explicitly depending on the uh, system. And then there are some implementation details I want to uh, Okay, so this was the approach. Um, and I have also promised to talk a little bit about ASD. Uh, so here's the quiz for you. Uh, for those who have, 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 have worked with ASD, maybe... So I will provide my answers for the sake of time. Um, maybe they are not correct. I think Frank can uh, be a judge and say if I, what I have discovered was not right. Uh, so how to get a record of a particular SDF system and know it's a SDF file? Uh, so my solution was actually like this. So you should load a SD file, but load the SD file doesn't return like the list of systems defined in it. So then you should, when you know the name of the system, you should ask in the center registry and uh, it will, the second uh, thing that you will return will be currently uh, the record for the system. Yeah. Another part. How do you find all SD files? Uh, so, it's not possible with current uh, SDF system search functions. So, if you want to do exhaustive search, you need to define some of your, your own function, which will be a little bit tedious because, first of all, you need to handle center registry and uh, source registry, which I don't do here. Uh, you, you also have to depend on some uh, SDF non-public functions like probeSD and also you should just define a lot of machine which is already in SDF but which is not accessible directly. Mm. You know, the final thing is uh, how do you, this is I think interesting, how do you just load all the components of the system without triggering all this uh, reloading of all the dependent systems and triggering SDF for great process? So my approach was, I, will, I just uh, added a flag that uh, in the, uh, the defined basically the behavior of the variable uh, and uh, um, yeah, so uh, and uh, just enumerate all the components of the system and load them uh, with SDF but without triggering all the operations prepare all those bigger like building a plan for this, which is obviously not the way uh, to work with the SDF, but what should they do? Force not team will do that for you. No, I tried it. No, of course not even force. There are a lot of things that force in order. <laughs> you go out into it. Uh, it uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, I'm uh, finishing now. Uh, so what are the main conclusions? First of all, uh, it really works. So you can do it, given some limitations that are actually, from my point of view, very reasonable. If you want to, uh, if you want to support interactive workflow, you can do a lot of things. You can do manual renaming. But if you want to support automatic workflows, like in your new system, which doesn't uh, allow for uh, interruption and uh, manual work, you need to have an automatic way. And this automatic way is it covers all the cases, um, but to do it, you can 
at least I have to define what class phase the other uh, And this is so more work needs to be done to make it not just usable but usable as, as a library. For instance, it doesn't uh, work with SDF source registry, it doesn't handle other operations except world code. Uh, so I need this project SDFX for lack of a better name, a little bit arrogantly, but uh, I think that actually SDF has a lot of potential for improvement in terms of this uh, capacity of handling different workflows of uh, working with uh, system files. So, uh, it has a lot of uh, things already, already good, but they are not exposed as a, as a proper API, not documented. Uh, the brand API, for instance, is not documented at all, but it's a crucial part of the SDF. There are also the dependencies between operations and how they, they work. And also, I think SDF should improve in terms of making these operations more special transparent. So this is, I think, uh, a very interesting and promising uh, direction of work. Uh, for the future, maybe in the future we could incorporate such in, into the SDF directly. Uh, thanks. Well, thank you for your attention. Okay, quick questions, and then we go all for lunch. <laughs> uh, one problem that, that you don't need to solve is um, uh, data that is passed which, uh, through the using system from one version of a library to another version of a library that could then be having the same, the wrong format. I'm not sure if I'm saying that properly, but uh, so, so if you have a dependency and that creates, like for example, a CLP PCRE creates a mapper in one version and then you pass that mapper to another version of CLP PCRE to work with it. Um, so that's not strictly a naming problem, but it's a problem of passing data around. Do you have any thoughts regarding uh, how that could be solved? Yeah, there are actually two cases here. Yeah, one case is when this uh, mapper, for instance, is uh, referenced by, for instance, uh, global web uh, in this area, and you pass this. So this is, in this case, it's a naming conflict, and it is solved because this variable will be referenced from a different package. So there will be basically two versions of this variable defined one in the first package, and the package will be a name. And it will be referenced by like PPCRE1 uh, uh, member, and then there will be PPCRE2 member, which will have a different character, so there will be no conflict. The other case is when, for instance, you do some, when you go to PPCRE, you uh, do some integration of other packages, uh, global variables or other packages data, data just in, uh, in the, some global community data that, is not, that doesn't go to so when you just not just define the whole <laughs> names in the package, but when you reference up. So basically one dimension, uh, this can be different. And this is not handled here. I don't think it's, it should be handled because monkey patching by nature is the thing that you, you want to introduce some change to a different system without out No, I'm not, I'm not talking about monkey patching. I'm talking about passing data around that doesn't have a name that could still be dependent on the version. Like how, how, how can you access it if it doesn't have a name? Well, so if, if, I, if I call the CRE on a string, yeah. then I get a mapper back. That's yeah. a PPCRE object. Mm -hmm. And then I pass it to another library, and that passes it to its own version of CLPPCRE, mm -hmm. which is a different version. And then, then the data will just be passed around without having been named at all, and there will also yes. be no global data. And that's, that's I mean, that's that's a, a risk mm -hmm. that, that uh, I don't know how yeah, this is risk is for sure. So there are limitations to this approach. But uh, I don't think this is, yeah, you're right, this is not a name conflict. This is a conflict at a different level, and I think it's probably it's easily solved programmatically. Uh, you just have to uh, properly uh, know what you're doing. Because, uh, anyway, this uh, workflow would happen in your code. The problem with name conflicts, I think, the most severe part is that it happens between third party libraries. Because you can't impact reasonably. You should go and patch them, this is not a good but if you uh, have a problem with your code, uh, if you can address, then it's uh, solvable in some way. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you.